you're putting on your white coats, your scrubs, your, your stethoscopes, and coming out here tonight. It means a tremendous amount to all of us here, and I think we made an impression on Blue Cross and to the entire private insurance industry to see us here together. This is very powerful. We're demonstrating in front of Blue Cross Blue Shield because this is an organization that adds no value to the healthcare system and takes an enormous amount of money out of the healthcare system. So for every dollar that our patients pay in premium, only about 82 cents of that actually ends up paying for medical care. And the rest goes for the enormous paperwork that they inflict on doctors and hospitals and for the outrageous incomes they pay themselves as well as the clerical and administrative workers who through no fault of their own are employed in this system. So we're saying we need to use that money for health care. We know that there can be a much more efficient health care system and a much fairer one that can get much more care to the American people. We could cover everybody for what we're now spending if we just said no profits, no insurance companies really ripping us off. What do we want? Single pay. Yeah, there's about 18 of us out from Oregon, from Healthcare for All Oregon, for this national demonstration uh, advocating for single-payer health care in America, Medicare, improved Medicare for All. Uh, there seem to be about 300 people here from all over the country, and we've got a conference this weekend where the 20 or so states that are working on developing universal publicly funded health care are all here to share information on how to build this movement. Well, we've got a pretty robust grassroots movement going in Oregon. We've got about 118 organizations and a coalition, about 25 of those are unions. And uh, we're building, uh, we've got 20,000 people in our database, chapters all over the state, and we're working really hard. Both We've run single-payer bills in the legislature for three sessions. We just passed a bill for a study, uh, uh, a study to be done by the Oregon Health Authority to uh, determine the best way to get to a universal health care system. And we are working toward going to ballot measure and achieve, achieving it in Oregon. Speaker is Martha Cruel, Secretary Treasurer of National Nurses United. I'm a registered nurse and I take care of children with cancer and other serious diseases. I want to concentrate solely on providing those kids the best possible care. I want their parents to be able to concentrate on them 100% too. And without having to constantly worry about how to pay for their care, parents worry about co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, out-of-pocket expenses, and all the bills that add up when you have a sick child. Many will agree with me that all children deserve health care. But how can children, but how can children get health care if their parents don't have it? How can parents provide that care for their kids if they don't have health care? Medicare for all will truly guarantee health care coverage for all of us. Medicare is our success story. We love success stories in America. Medicare will level the playing field. We love level playing fields. Join with us, get involved in the movement, and demand health care as a human right. Everybody in! Nobody out! Everybody in! Nobody out! Next on our list of speakers is Tom Conway, Vice President of United Steelworkers Union. Thank you, Doctor. And thank all of you for coming out here. This is really an important kind of a coalition. And to see healthcare professionals out on the street with the labor movement, with healthcare activists, building the kind of coalition it's going to take to make this change. We just have to keep doing it and growing it. We have, we don't have a broken delivery system in terms of who's taking care of us in doctor's offices and in hospitals and the nurses and the docs who are taking care of us. We have a broken payment system and this building is a testament to the kind of money that it rakes in and what it keeps for itself. And when you can keep 20 cents on a dollar profit and not deliver health care for it, 
that truly is blood money. And in every major city, when you go around this country, you'll find one of these buildings, whether it's Anthem, whether it's Highmark, but this cartel of the blues is out there sucking the life out of what we're doing, out of the middle class. It won't treat the poor. It won't pay doctors and nurses. I was married to a nurse for 38 years. I have two daughter-in-laws who are RNs. We never let a doctor in a family, but we like nurses. And so, and, 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 and we know that that money is not going into the hands of doctors and nurses. This is not an overpaid industry. This is where this money lies. And this is to, to think that the people come out of school, carry the kind of debt they're paying, step into the healthcare field and try and save lives and make things better for people, and then they have to be stymied with this every day and sit on the phone and fight with insurers and fight for treatment and recode your things. It's a nonsense system. We've got to change it. America has to change it, and these are the coalitions that can do it. So thank you very much. The truth, in fact, is staring us right in the face. All we have to look, all we have to do is look at every other industrialized country in the world to see how simple the solution really is. We can even look within our own country for the answers to the big questions of how to provide lifetime, quality, affordable health care for 300 million Americans. Medicare is an example of efficiency. Medicare runs at an overhead administrative cost of less than 3%. While the for-profit, inefficient private insurance industry easily spends six times that on profit and overhead. This is a clear example of how publicly funded, publicly funded government-run health insurance outperforms all of its private insurance competitors. Please join me in fighting for what is right and telling the truth about the evils of the for-profit private insurance industry whose primary interest is in making a profit for their shareholders. We can democratize health care by democratizing our health insurance. And we do it by making health insurance public. Improved Medicare for all. Everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. Started and we have a full day and it's so exciting. I see so many of my friends here um, that I haven't gotten to speak to and I know y'all have done the same thing. But what I'd like to do at this time um, is, because you know, we, we do have a full agenda and I hope everybody is going to pay close attention to it so that we can get a lot done. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to, uh, we had a great opening yesterday. I want to thank all of the people involved in planning and executing this, uh, this conference. This is a, it's a very unique conference. We did a, a joint planning process with the three principal organizations that uh, uh, put this conference on, uh, Labor Campaign for Single Payer, Healthcare Now, and uh, One Payer States Group. And, uh, you know, anybody who's done these things know when you bring in three different organizations with different history and different uh, work plans and things like that, it can be kind of difficult to kind of put things together. So we kind of stumbled around for a little while thinking how we could really build a, a conference that uh, united uh, this uh, single payer movement and uh, uh, helped us get some strategic direction for where we could go next and understand this moment and, and the future moments before us. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from the Canadian experience. Now, I watched that system develop from the very beginning to where it is today. And it is a single payer system, as all of you know. And it really shaped my belief that that's the way it ought to go. Now, the story of the Canadian healthcare system is really the story of somebody who perhaps you know his name. If you don't, every Canadian knows his name. Tommy Douglas, absolutely. He championed universal 
health care for everyone in Saskatchewan. His proposal was uh, perhaps the most politically explosive thing that ever happened in Canada. So you've got to keep remembering, if you're gonna, what, you're, what you're coming here to do in the United States, it, it's already, we've seen the movie of what happens. Now, <clears throat> the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Canadian Medical Association and even the AMA put on a huge campaign against him uh, and particularly in the 1960 election, uh, they were determined to get rid of him because he was such a burr under their saddle. Now, the people of Saskatchewan ignored it. And they, the scare tactics just didn't work. And they awarded Douglas a supermajority in the state parliament. Uh, with that mandate to pursue sweeping health care reform, Saskatchewan implemented America's first single-payer system in 1962. Organized medicine was absolutely terrified. The idea of single-payer terrifies the, military, the medical industrial complex. They really are worried when they see people like you getting together and thinking and starting and going out there and messing around and stirring up the troops in your states. In the summer of 1962, Saskatchewan's doctors went on strike. I mean, I was in medical school. Here they are. The doctors are striking just across the border. And they waged a vicious campaign against health care reform, describing the program as socialized medicine. Never heard that, have you? And the assault was going to be on the doctor-patient relationship. And you hear the same thing today. I mean, they have not changed their mantra. And <clears throat> in 23 days in Canada, in, in Saskatchewan, there were no doctors who would take patients. So Tommy Douglas started recruiting them from the United States and from Great Britain and Quebec. And, they, and pretty soon after 23 days, the doctors relented because the people were firm in their determination that they wanted a single payer system. Now, it, it's been an unmitigated success. And it, was, it wasn't long before every other province was looking over and saying, gee, those guys out in the prairie got this thing going. Why can't we have it here in Ontario? Or why can't we have it in Quebec? Or why can't we have it in Prince Edward Island or British Columbia? And <clears throat> by 1966, three years later, the Parliament enacted the Medical Care Act, creating a nationwide single-payer system. So it only took three years of it happening in one state and then watching, and everybody watching to see if it worked. And then, lo and behold, it happened for all of Canada. In, in the 60s, there was a profound upheaval, a social upheaval in this country that the, uh, Donna and Ben referred to and, and Jim McDermott, the civil rights movement, the greatest social movement uh, since World War II, and it still, of course, has unfinished business. But in the midst of that social movement, what happened? The greatest expansion of publicly financed health care in the U.S., ever, yeah. Medicare and Medicaid. Woo. Now compare that to the moments in 92, 93, and 2009, 2010. All moments of great upheaval for healthcare. That is, it was a reform moment for healthcare. There was not the broad social movement, and what we faced was we were basically the single payer tail wagging in the healthcare reform movement dog that somebody else decided what was going to do. In 1992, the Democrats abandoned single payer in their platform. In 1992, the AFL-CIO took a position other than single payer. And Mrs. Clinton put forward a proposal. She was wrong 20 years ago, 23 years ago, and she's wrong today. Yeah the presidential candidate and ultimately the president defined the agenda in 92-93. And the same happened in 2009-2010. The um, grand wizards of the public option decided that was politically viable, so we weren't going to talk about single payer. When we met with Senator Kennedy, he said, hey, I got 11 senators for single payer, so I'm not going to do it. And Barack Obama, of course, adopted an agenda that resulted in the Affordable Care Act. So what is the difference between 1965 and those other two periods? The difference is, A, there was a movement 
that demanded change, and that movement had a direct impact on what the president put forward. We are in that position today. So when you ask yourself, what can I do for single payer, look at the 74-year-old white guy who's running around the country every time he ends a speech or talks a speech and he says, I, we have a health care as a right and I want improved Medicare for all. That's what we can do. We can help that guy. And we have to understand what, in the broader context, what the fight is about. And ultimately, the fight is about the role of government. And if the fight is about the role of government, it is inherently political. It is not going to be enough to have the winning policy argument. We have to engage politically in a way that takes on the power that is opposed to us. So when we build this movement, we've got to understand the political moment we're in, we've got to understand the power they're up against, and we've got to take every opportunity to build that movement. And right now, right now, if, if the Medicare for All candidate wins Iowa, wins New Hampshire, wins Nevada, and wins South Carolina, then we will be on our way to single payer in this country in a whole new way than we've ever been. So at the plenary session here at the conference on single payer, we, there was a presentation on how to engage in the political campaign, in the presidential political campaign. And in that discussion, there was some give and take. And what I said was that we need to engage in the presidential campaign on behalf of Bernie Sanders, and that the Democratic Party is putting out that he is not electable, yet he is speaking for all of us on so many issues, not just Medicare for all, but he's speaking about income inequality, about taking back control of, of our elections from corporate finance, about housing injustice, about Black Lives Matters. We believe that working with Bernie is actually going to make connections and build a social movement. He's engaging the pu public in a campaign pain like no one has for a long time. He stands for nurses' values. I'm a nurse. Vote nurses' values. If he doesn't win the nomination, he, I think he said that he will continue to stay within the Democratic Party and presumably support Hillary, or is that clear? And what do you think of that? He may have said that, but my point of view, and National Nurses United point of view, would be that we're building a movement for social change to achieve social and economic justice, and that movement can't stop if he, if he ends up not in the campaign. We will have to hold every elected politician accountable for their positions that harm all of us, or their positions that help advance all of our interests and make our society more just.